Have you ever wondered how spacecraft maneuver while they are in orbit? They have small groups of thrusters known as reaction control systems, or RCS, that can control the orientation and in some cases translate the spacecraft. They work by ejecting mass to create a reaction force that can move the spacecraft around its center of mass. Can we examine such a design problem using what we've learned in statics thus far? Examining a complete spacecraft in three dimensions is perhaps a bit too complex for us at this moment, but we can look at an overly simplified case to understand the analysis, what I will call the wonky space capsule for reasons that will hopefully become apparent in a minute. Our hypothetical spacecraft is illustrated here. It has a main thruster that is aligned with the central axis of the spacecraft and two smaller thrusters that are oriented at an angle of 70 degrees and 55 degrees with respect to the central axis of the spacecraft. Our problem statement for this spacecraft is what is the equivalent force couple at the center of mass or point O as a function of the magnitudes of the three thruster forces. For this we will define an axis system aligned with the central axis of the spacecraft. We then need to determine the location of these thrusters in our defined coordinate system, which is provided here as coordinates from the center of mass in the units of meters. We now have all the information we need to determine what the resultant force, R, and resultant couple, M sub R, acting at the center of mass due to the thrusters is. Now that we understand the problem statement, we now have to choose a solution methodology. We have seen that we can analyze what a resultant force moment system is by using vector formulation or vector decomposition. We've already looked at an example that uses vector decomposition, so we will use the vector formulation for this example. We now examine our equations to find our resultant force and moment, and the resultant force comes from summing all of the force vectors. So our resultant force R becomes F1 plus F2 plus F3. We will call this equation I. We also can look at some of the moments that tells us that our overall moment couple MR will be the summation of all the cross products of the position vector R crossed with the force of the thruster F. Uh, where the position vectors will be defined as uh, the distance between our center of mass and our thruster. Now, we can already see a simplification in this problem in the sense that force F1 passes through the center of mass. So it will not actually create a moment about that point. So we see that R1 cross F1 will actually be zero. So we can already simplify the equation. We will call this equation, equation 2, or sub ii. Now that we have our two summation equations, we know what vectors we need. We need to determine what these vectors are. We can start with the force vectors and very easily see that force vector F1 will have a magnitude of F1, and it is acting completely in the y direction. So it will have a direction cosine of negative 1. If we look at force 2, it will have a magnitude F2, and it will have an x component of the sine of 70 degrees, but it's in the negative direction, so negative sine 70, and a y component in the positive y of cosine 70. We can then evaluate those expressions and get our numerical values. Again, similarly for F3, uh, it will be in the positive x and positive y, and we will get uh, the x component will be sine 55, the y component will be cosine 55, and there is no component in the z direction because it's acting within the plane. We can then calculate those numerical values. Now we also, for our moment equation here, we need two position vectors, r2 and r3. So we'll start by defining R2 as the distance between the center of mass and our thruster, F2. And here we can see that we can actually just use our coordinates for the location of the thruster. 
because that actually defines the position vector because we conveniently located our coordinate system at the center of mass. Similarly for R3, um, our position vector will be given by the coordinates. So x is 1 meter, y is 4 meters, and z is 0 meters in this case. Now we can go on to calculate things because we've determined all our vectors. So we'll start with calculating the reaction force, which will be F1 plus F2 plus F3. Uh, subbing in our results that we calculated for our vectors here, we will get the following equation. And we can see here that you're going to get a complex summation of all these magnitudes, and we see that the Z values are zero. So to clean up the notation, when I add them, I will break it up into the X and Y components. So the I components become 0 F1 uh, minus 0 0.940 F2 plus 0 0.819 F3. So that's this component here. We can then add the uh, Y component from this line, uh, and our Z component is 0 in this case. So this is, don't be afraid by the alternative formulation of it. Um, it just saves a little bit of space here. We can now look at our resultant moment from our equation 2, where the uh, force 1 component we said was 0, or the cross product. So we only have R2 cross F2 plus R3 cross F3. So we can now evaluate each of these cross products. So R2 cross F2, uh, we can determine using the Amsterdam method, where we stack our position vector on top of itself twice. So that's just R2 here stacked on itself twice, and our force vector, F2, right here, stacked on itself twice. And in this method, if you recall, we cross out the top and bottom row, and then we evaluate the cross products of the uh, various rows. So it will get minus 2 times 0, minus 0 times 0.342 F2, which ends up just being 0 minus 0, uh, and similarly, we will get 0 minus 0 for the next uh, uh, evaluation, next line of the evaluation. And the last one will be non-zero. We will get minus 1 times 0 0.342 F2, this value here, minus negative 2 times negative 0 0.94 F2. And this is in the k direction. So this gives us our three components. And we will get that it's... 2.22 F2 in the K direction. And note here that I've put units of meters, not because the units of this whole thing is meters, but the units of the number. F2, we can still put the units in, which would have newtons, so forth. So our result so far is uh, just from this cross product, we need to evaluate the next cross product. So to do that, again, we can use the Amsterdam method and I'll go through it a little bit more quickly, but we get those first two uh, components are, are zero because of the multiplication of zero on each line. And then our last one, uh, we will get one times 0.574 F3 minus four times 0.819 F3, which results in negative 2.70 F3 in the K direction. Uh, and then we can add this in and this becomes our final expression for our resultant moment. Again, the units meters reflects the numbers. We would still have to substitute in the units of our force when we place that, uh, those values into the equation. So here we have our final results. We should take a moment to think whether they make any sense. And we can actually look at a few things. Since our model is two-dimensional, we would expect our resultant force to be, cont be contained within the xy plane. And indeed it is. We only have an x and y component to our uh, resultant force. Similarly, if you think about the uh, resultant moment, it should be causing a re rotation or would tend to cause a rotation uh, within the xy plane. So about the z axis coming in and out of the page. And indeed, our moment only is acting in the z direction. So at least from the, uh, the directions and all of that, that makes sense. Now, uh, it's hard to evaluate the, the numbers because we 
did not actually put thrust values in here. We kept it in parametric form. And you may ask, well, why keep it in parametric form? You'll see a lot of e examples within the textbook have numbers and you're evaluating an actual fixed value. Uh, we do that in a lot of textbook problems to practice, but I wanted to show you this parametric form because this is very useful in an engineering analysis. And I will show you that in the next few slides, but I will warn you this kind of goes a little bit beyond what you would do in most problems, but it shows you how applicable such a parametric equation is. So let's take a look. We can first look at our moment equation. This was the moment equation we came up with as a function of our two thrusters, F2 and F3. Remember, F1 was aligned with the center of mass, so it would not cause a moment. I can plot this as a actual contour surface. So here we see a contour plot where the color is showing you the, uh, the value of the moment. And then I have on the x-axis F2, so I treated F2 as my x variable and F3 as my y variable, just plotting this function. Now, why is this useful? Well, you can imagine you might want to create a certain uh, resultant moment to cause a rotation of the spacecraft. But as you can see here, these contour lines tell me that I have multiple thrusts that can give me that value. So I can look here, for instance, and at this point um, of the contour line, it's approximately 275 newtons uh, for this thruster, or, or sorry, for, for, the, for F2, and approximately 600 newtons for uh, F3. Alternatively, I could produce the same rotational moment, but with a thruster force of 650 newtons um, and 900 newtons. Now, obviously, hopefully it doesn't come as much of a surprise that, to you that this would be way less efficient, right? You have to pl uh, apply two larger thrusts, so you would have to eject a lot more mass or use a lot more fuel to get that rotation. So such a plot could help you evaluate the efficiency of certain maneuvers. It also allows you to observe something else, and that is what this plot is missing. This doesn't show us the resultant force. So if we did certain maneuvers, you might get a different translation out of it. But what we can observe is a particular line where our re resultant moment is zero. And in this case, that is where F2 is equal to 1.22 F3. You can actually solve for this line by just setting this equation equal to zero and solving for F2 as a function of F3. This is an interesting line because along this line, this is the combination of thruster forces that would not cause a rotation. So the spacecraft would only translate. So what we could do is examine all the possible maneuvers where you would avoid the rotation. We could take our resultant force equation that we already came up with in parametric form. If we apply the condition that F2 is equal to 1.22 F3, which was the condition where our resultant moment was zero, then this equation simplifies a little bit. And we get that our reaction force is negative 0.324 F3 in the I direction, plus 0.99 F3 minus F1 in the J uh, direction. I can now see that this isn't a um, simple magnitude value. This is a vector equation still. So what I can now do is plot a vector field. So if I look here on one axis, I have F3, and on the other axis I have F1, and I've plotted for different combinations what the resultant uh, force would be in the terms of a vector field. So obviously, if we're only applying thruster F1, uh, and zero on, uh, on the other thrusters, then I'm only going to get a downwards uh, thrust because our thruster is down here, it would be pointing downwards. Uh, but you can get different combinations of translations without rotating the aircraft.
you could then evaluate the, the aspect of fuel efficiency, but you have to be a little bit careful here, right? We, this axis is only showing F3, uh, but we also have to ensure that F2 is equal to 1.22 F3. So there's actually a lot more thrust than what is shown on this axis. So we could draw an alternative axis, which would be F2 plus F3. And here you see the total thrust from the two smaller thrusters uh, corresponding to this vector field. And you could see if I wanted to translate the aircraft with or apply a downwards force, the thruster one would probably be more efficient. But if I wanted to go in the other direction, I could go here. But now I'm uh, using up a lot of thrust from my other thrusters. So that's not so fuel efficient. You might actually want to rotate the aircraft first to get into an orientation where you can use this more efficient direction. So hopefully um, that gave you an idea of some of the things that you can do in terms of further analysis. I, I admit it goes a bit beyond what we would expect for you to be doing within a lot of statics problems. Um, but I think it's really important for you to see where the, the skills and tools you are learning now are going towards so that you will be able to see that you can apply it to much more interesting problems, design problems and, and decision making um, situations, which is really the crux of engineering.